All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Um, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight we're diving right back into the Majima Nikaya. We're moving right on to the next sutta. This is going to be sutta number 48, the Kosambia Sutta. This is the sutta to the Kosambians. So the people that lived at Kosambi. That's the place where this is going to happen. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking about this sutta tonight. It's kind of, I wouldn't actually say that this is a famous sutta, but I would say that the events that are kind of the background to this sutta are very famous. So what it is, is that there were a group of monks in Kosambi, which is this, it's a location. And Kosambi, the group of monks at Kosambi, it was the first instance of a schism in the Sangha. This took place, I was, I was trying to do as much research as I could on this. Most sutta or most accounts are that this is around the year six. So of the Buddha's you know, forming of the Sangha and teaching, you know, he teaches for 45 years, but six years into it, I, I read another source where it was nine years into this. I'm going to talk about that in a moment, but several years into the Buddha's teaching, an event takes place at Kusambi and it divides the, the Sangha. And this sutta that we're going to read tonight, it, it, is a sutta to the the bhikkhus at Kosambi, and it's about the fact that they are quarreling. But the sutta that we're reading tonight isn't going to tell us why they're quarreling. It it presumes you already know about the problem the problem in Kosambi. So allow me to kind of paraphrase quickly the story, but I also want to kind of talk about it a little bit because I think it's really interesting. By the way. A lot of the information I'm about to give you, you could find in a book called The Life of the Buddha. This is by Bhikkhu Nyanamoli. And what this is, is, is that you'll, um, it is a kind of a biography basically of the Buddha. But what's really interesting about it is that it's a biography where everything is taken from either the suttas or the Vinaya, or other kind of ancient commentary. And so it's it's a it's an interesting book because it basically contextualizes a lot of the events that are taking place in the suttas. And because the suttas, as as you may know from Dharma doors, they're not in chronological order. They're they're all over the place and they're pretty much thematically grouped. And so what Bhikkhu Nyanamoli did was basically go through all of the biographical information and he kind of put it into a chronology. So he has a whole chapter, and it's chapter eight, the, the quarrel at Kosambi. And so let me tell you basically what happened. So it, this is in Kosambi. And there was a visiting uh, sutra master. So a, a, a particular teacher of sut sutras or suttas who was visiting Kosambi. And at Kosambi, there was a resident Vinaya master. So a master of the Vinaya or the Vinaya, the, the, the discipline, the moral code, right? Now, what happened was, and the, the details on this, I was trying to really nail it down. So again, this is kind of a rough paraphrase. But what happens is, is that the visiting monk goes to the bathroom. And at Kosambi, they apparently had a rule that you were not supposed to leave leftover unused water in the latrine, in the bathroom. And that was the water that you would use to, you know, wash yourself, wash your hands. So the sutra master left a little bit of water 
And later on, he was confronted by the discipline master. And the discipline master came up to him and said, hey, you broke a rule. And the sutra master was like, what rule? He says, you broke the rule of against leaving the water. And the, the sutra master goes, oh, I didn't know that that was a rule that you guys had here. And so the, the Vinaya master, the discipline master says, oh, well, if you didn't know it was a rule, then you didn't break the rule intentionally. And so the sutra master goes on his way. But then what happens is, is that the discipline master, the, the Vinaya master, starts to talk about the sutra master and basically says, yeah, the new guy, the new guy doesn't even know when he's broken a rule. And it raises this interesting kind of issue. And what happens is, is that word gets back to the sutra master that the Vinaya master is talking bad about him and basically saying he broke a rule. And he basically goes up to him and is like, yo, you, you said I didn't break a rule because I didn't know that it was a rule. Like, what's going on? And it all comes down to basically that if he did know it was a rule and he, he broke it knowingly, then he should be suspended, uh, kind of, um, you're kind of put on timeout, basically, and you can't join the monastic order for a couple of weeks, or it could even be months, depending upon the severity of the offense. So the group at Kosambi decides to put the sutra master on timeout and suspend him. But he's like, why am I suspended? You said I didn't break the rule and all of that. So the sutra master starts to get a group of monks that are backing him, that are saying, yeah, it's wrong that, that he shouldn't be suspended. The other group is listening to the Vinaya master saying, no, he should be suspended. He doesn't even know what the rules are. So this is what causes a schism or a quarrel in the Sangha. <clears throat> now, you, we are also, we're not going to get the total backstory on how the Buddha resolves this. So let me kind of give you the short version of it. And I, I wanted to share this with you because even though, you know, this is an ancient story, this is an event that maybe happened 2,500 years ago, I think that it's very, very applicable. Like you could really, really translate this to the modern world. And what I mean is, I, I was trying to think of an example and the example that came to my mind was a couple who are cohabitating for the first time. <laughs> and let's just say that it's a, a, a man and a woman and the man leaves the toilet seat up, as men sometimes do. And so then let's say his new, you know, his girlfriend or spouse or whoever living together for the first time is like, hey, don't leave that up. And if the husband is like, oh, I didn't know that that would bother you. <laughs> well, you didn't know that that would bother me. So don't worry about it, right? But then the wife goes off and says this thing about her stupid husband always leaving the toilet seat up. And then it's kind of like, but wait, you said it wasn't a problem. And then you might have a quarrel between partners in that way. So let me tell you what happens at Kosambi. Word get, gets back to the Buddha that there's a problem at Kosambi. And so the Buddha goes, and he basically, he meets with both parties. And what he says to the, he goes to, I forget which, you know, which one he goes to first, but he goes to the Vinaya master, the one that decided to, um, to sequester or seclude the, the monk. 
And he basically, the Buddha says, look, the most important thing here is that we don't quarrel. And he's like, so I really think that you should rethink your, your suspending of him. And he didn't know what the rule was. And in order to preserve cohesion among the Sangha, I really think that you should basically uh, lift the suspension. And the the sutra, the, sorry, the Vinaya master in that group basically says, no, we're not going to do that. The Buddha goes to the monk who left the water, the sutra master who left the water. And the Buddha's like, look, I know you didn't know that it was a rule. And I know that he said the whole thing about it wasn't a rule, but then he kind of backtracked on that. He says, but in order to preserve cohesion among the Sangha, you should you should apologize. And the, the monk's like, but I didn't know that it was a rule. Like, why should I apologize? And the Buddha says, you should apologize to maintain social cohesion. That's why. And basically the monk is really stubborn. And he's like, no, I didn't break the rule. I'm not gonna apologize for it. And so the Buddha basically says, I'm, I'm out of this. Now the story that we're about to read is the Buddha's kind of next attempt at reconciling this. So I want you to know that the Buddha already tried, like he already tried giving his wisdom. And I think it's really good wisdom in that way, in terms of even a relationship, a, a couple, anybody cohabitating, or just any kind of relationship, <laughs> any sangha, that taking social cohesion as being more important, as the most important, I think is going to be an interesting thing for us to think about. So, all right. Let's dive in. Aspects of the backstory might pop up or might be relevant. Otherwise, um, this sutta has like, oh, it kind of has like two parts to it. So let's kind of dive into the first part. So again, this is sutta number 48 of the middle length discourses, the Majima Nikaya. And this is to the Kasambians. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Kosambi in Gosita's park. Now, on that occasion, the bhikkhus at Kosambi had taken to quarreling and brawling and were deep in dispute, stabbing each other with verbal daggers. They could neither convince each other nor be convinced by others. They could neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others. Then a certain bhikkhu went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and informed him of what was happening. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain bhikkhu thus, Come, bhikkhu, tell those bhikkhus in my name that the teacher calls them. Yes, venerable sir, he replied, and he went to those bhikkhus and told them the teacher calls the venerable ones. Yes, friend, they replied, and they went to the blessed one. And after paying homage to him, they sat down to one side. The blessed one then asked them, Bhikkhus, is it true that you've taken to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers? that you can neither convince each other nor be convinced by others, that you can neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others? Yes, venerable sir. <laughs> but bhikkhus, what do you think? When you take to quarreling, brawling, and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, do you on that occasion maintain acts of loving kindness of body, speech, and mind in public and in private towards your companions in the holy life? No, venerable sir. <laughs> so, bhikkhus, when you take to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, and on that occasion, you don't maintain acts of loving kindness of body, speech, and mind in public or private towards your companions in the holy life? 
misguided men. What can you possibly know? What can you see that you take to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, that you can neither convince each other nor be convinced by others, that you can neither persuade each other nor be persuaded by others? Misguided men, that will lead you to your harm and suffering for a long time. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, there are six principles of cordiality that create love and respect and conduce to cohesion, non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. What are those six? Here, a bhikkhu maintains bodily acts of loving kindness both in public and in private, towards his companions in the holy life. This is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to cohesion, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. Again, a bhikkhu maintains verbal acts of loving kindness, both in public and in private, towards their companions in the holy life. This too is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to cohesion, to non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. Again, a bhikkhu maintains mental acts of loving kindness, both in public and in private, towards their companions in the holy life. This too is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to cohesion, non-dispute, to concord, and to unity. All right, I'm going to pause there. I want to do <clears throat> so these six aspects of cordiality. I kind of want to take them in groups of three. So the Buddha's already mentioned this. This is sort of the main, I would even say this is the main theme of the sutta, metta, loving kindness. That's kind of what this is about. Um, you know, what is metta? What is loving kindness? Well, it's the opposite of quarreling and stabbing each other with verbal daggers. That's the idea of loving kindness, of course. And so the Buddha's already basically said, like, so when you guys are quarreling and stabbing each other with verbal daggers, are you being lovingly kind in body, speech, and mind towards each other? And the bhikkhu has uh, the, the bhikkhus have already applied like no, like obviously we are not being loving, lovingly kind towards each other. So the Buddha says, well, in terms of the six major kind of rules in that way for maintaining social cohesion, the first three of them are this um, metam kaya karma or karman. So this loving kindness of acts of body. And basically what I want to do is I want to break down the aspects of this. So we have acts of loving kindness in body, speech, and mind. And we also have these acts of loving kindness in body, speech, and mind that are in public and in private. So, you know, the basic, you know, we don't have to go too deep into all of this, but I do want to kind of acknowledge that there is a difference, of course, between acts of loving kindness with the body and the speech and the mind. And from a Buddhist point of view, it's kind of important to think about the differences in those. And, you know, what I mean is an act of loving kindness with the body might be an act of giving, might be an act of lending, literally lending a hand, like to you know, help somebody do something in that way. But the idea is, is that you could be, you know, performing acts of loving kindness with your body, but in your mind, you're sitting there going, this person is a jerk or whatever. And so it could very well be that there's loving meta acts of meta with the body, but not the mind or speech and not the mind being kind of duplicitous in that way. 
So we just kind of want to acknowledge that there is being lovingly kind, having metta in what we're doing with our body versus how we're using our voice versus our mental disposition. And then we do those three things, both publicly and in private, in that sense. And in this sutta, actually, it, or at least part of the backstory, in terms of the public aspect of this, Ananda in particular, if, if you read like um, the backstory on this in the Vinaya and in other suttas, Ananda's really worried that basically like everybody's seeing these people quarrel. And so they're starting to basically not support Buddhists in, in the area of Kosambi. Like it's kind of giving Buddhism a bad name. And so that sort of is one detriment to the public displays of quarreling and not being lovingly kind. And then, of course, there's behind closed doors or in private in that way. So I just wanted to pause here to make sure there were no questions about meta, like what we're talking about. Of course, it's a major you know, component of Buddhist practice. Well, you know, well explained. Cool. So. Let's go into these next three, which are a little more, well, they're a little more detailed, give us something to discuss. So number four, again, a bhikkhu uses things in common with their various virtuous companions in the holy life. Without making reservations, they share with them any gain of any kind that accords with the dharma and that has been obtained in a way that accords with the Dharma, including even the mere contents of their begging bowl. This too is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to cohesion, non-dispute, concord, and to unity. Actually, let's just take this one just all by itself. So if you've been in a Buddhist monastery, of course, you've seen this firsthand, which is sort of the sharing of all things in that way. Um, it's a pretty standard part of, I would say, Buddhism is that, you know, I guess you could give it the label of communism in that sense, but, you know, it is the kind of sharing of things. I wanted to share with you all a sort of an interesting, uh, and I guess an anecdote regarding this one. So, when I was in graduate school, when I was doing my master's degree in Buddhist studies, there was actually a, a nun, a Buddhist nun from Taiwan, who was also doing a master's degree. And we kind of became friends in a way. I wound up doing a, pro a research project on her and her monastery. So we kind of became close. And I will never forget one day we, we went out uh, I think we got lunch or something like that and she paid and she used a credit card and I kind of was talking to her about like you know there's basically a lot of prohibitions in uh, the Buddhist uh, for Buddhist monastics around money touching gold and silver and all those things <clears throat> and so we got to talking about her credit card and what was interesting about it is, is that she, first of all, she made the, made the joke that uh, she was something to along the lines of, it's not a gold card, which, you know, but actually what she said though, which was more interesting was, is that it's not her credit card, it's the monasteries. And she was kind of, not sent to the university, uh, this was in Hawaii, uh, she was kind of sent there by the monastery to study and do her research project. But what that meant was, is that, you know, that they, they were covering the bill in that way. But then we even got to a, you know, a deeper conversation about it. And she, she wore robes, you know, the whole time I knew her and she was very, in her mind, she seemed very clear that she was borrowing the robes that even though they had been tailored for her body, <laughs> they were still not hers in that way, or at least she really demonstrated a 
non-ownership of them, like a deep sense of like really just borrowing them, just using them. Again, with the credit card, it was a real sense of the the shared economy of the monastery in that way. So I just wanted to let you know that in the modern world, a lot of Buddhist organizations still very much kind of follow this model of not, of basically owning things in, in communion in that way. So um, any questions? I guess we could just sort of mention to take a, you know, we want to always, for this sutta, we want to be thinking, okay, like acts of loving kindness with body, speech, and mind. I can see how that would create cohesion and unity. Now what we want to look at is this idea of sharing things, right? And noticing that like, oh, right. If there's this kind of like private ownership of things, that could probably pretty easily lead to quarreling and argument. But if there's sort of non-ownership and sharing things in that way, it kind of makes sense that that would be more conducive to cohesion and unity. So let's think about number five. Again, a bhikkhu dwells both in public and in private, possessing in common with their companions in the holy life those virtues that are unbroken, untorn, unblotched, unmolted, liberating, commended by the wise, not misapprehended, and conducive to samadhi, concentration. This too is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to cohesion, non-dispute, concord, and to unity. So this, of course, is about shila, about maintaining the moral precepts that, of course, are commended by the wise. Um, uh, yeah, I think that would be a pretty understandable how it would be that that maintaining the moral precepts would lead to social cohesion in that way. Whereas if people are running around stealing from each other, lying to each other, being violent towards each other, yeah, that might not be conducive to harmony. And number six, again, a bhikkhu dwells both in public and in private, Possessing, oh, sorry, yeah, possessing in common with their companions in the holy life, that view that is noble and emancipating and leads one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering. This too is a principle of cordiality that creates love and respect and conduces to, to cohesion, non-dispute, to concord and to unity. These are the six principles of cordiality that create love and respect and conduce to cohesion, non-dispute, concord, and to unity. Now, of these six principles, the chief, the most cohesive, the most unifying, is this view that is noble and emancipating and which leads the one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering. Just as the chief, the most cohesive, the most unifying part of a pinnacled house is the pinnacle itself, so too, of these six principles of cordiality, the chief, the most cohesive, the most unifying is this view that is noble and emancipating. So, of the six things that would lead to cohesion, the Buddha says, the chief among them is samyak drishti, the right view, having the right view. And this, of course, is the first step on the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, we also are aware, of course, that shila, in that sense, is also part of the Noble Eightfold Path. But what we're going to be kind of thinking about for the rest of tonight is 
we're going to be wanting to look at how this idea of the view, the right view, we want to be looking tonight at how if you have that, all else follows in that way. And that's how the reason why it's the chief in that way, the, the, the main principle of cordiality in that sense. Um, now, before I kind of, before we kind of dive deep into the second part, so this is the second part of the sutta, what we want to kind of, I, I don't know, I, I was, you know, I was reading and rereading and rereading this sutta, and I was thinking, you know, how to approach this. And one of the things that's going to be tricky about this is we want to, of course, know what this view is, right? Because it's the chief. <laughs> this, is, this is it. So if we've got this view. And so the thing, the trick tonight is going to be about what is that view? Exactly. Because the sutra is going to be a little tricky in that way. So the first thing the Buddha says in paragraph eight, he says, and how does this view that is noble and emancipating lead the one who practices in accordance with it to the complete destruction of suffering? Great question. Here, a bhikkhu, gone to the forest or to the root of a tree or to an empty hut, considers thus. Is there any obsession unabandoned in myself that might so obsess my mind that I cannot know or see things as they actually are? If a bhikkhu is obsessed with sensual lust, then the mind is obsessed. If one is obsessed with ill will, then the mind is obsessed. If one is obsessed by sloth and torpor, then the mind is obsessed. If the mind, if one is obsessed by restlessness and remorse, then the mind is obsessed. If one is obsessed by doubt, then the mind is obsessed. If a bhikkhu is absorbed in speculation about the world, then the mind is obsessed. If a bhikkhu is absorbed in speculation about the other world, then the mind is obsessed. If a bhikkhu takes to quarreling and brawling and is deep in disputes, stabbing others with verbal daggers, then the mind is obsessed. One understands this way. There is no obsession unabandoned in myself that might so obsess my mind that I cannot know and see things as they actually are. My mind is well disposed for awakening to the truths. This is the first knowledge attained by one that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. All right, so there's going to be seven of these uh, knowledges. And just to let you know now, not I don't want to keep any surprises, these seven knowledges that we're about to go through are what constitute stream entry. So you might be aware, you I know all of you are aware, but in early Buddhism, in the Theravada tradition, there's these four kind of stages of enlightenment, you could call it stream entry being the first level and then being what's called a once returner a non returner and then finally an arahat in the in the kind of older tradition so in terms of this in, initial stage of being a stream enterer there's always a lot of um mm, there's always a lot of conversation about what constitutes a stream enterer like when when do i get to call myself a stream enterer <laughs> Well, there's a lot of different interpretations of that. Um, and tonight we're going to have one, which is that if you meet these seven criteria, that's a stream enterer. So let's back up. So before I forget, I want to kind of 
state the main thing tonight, like the really, really main idea, because I know I'll forget. And then it'll come as like an afterthought at the end of the night. So in order to really articulate this view, like the noble view, I want to go back to, I guess it would be paragraph or section five, I guess, but I'm just going to read one little part. And what it was, it's, it's when the Buddha first gets to Kusambi and he asks them like, so can you be practicing loving kindness and quarreling at the same time? And they're like, no, you're like, we're, we're definitely not being loving kind towards each other. The Buddha says, so bhikkhus, when you take to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes, stabbing each other with verbal daggers, on that occasion, you do not maintain acts of loving kindness of body, speech, and mind in public and in private towards your companions in the holy life. And then he says, misguided men, what can you possibly know? What can you see that you take to quarreling and brawling and are deep in disputes? That's the question. What could you know or what could you see that would make you think that quarreling and brawling was the move? Like, what could possibly actually be that important? And so what we kind of want to, and this is what I mean in terms of like the, the right view here is a little, it's a little tricky because they're going to, in a way, just keep pointing at what the wrong view is. <laughs> and the wrong view is anything that you would quarrel about. And what we want to notice, and this is why I wanted to tell you about the backstory where the Buddha came to both parties and was basically like, yo, for cohesion's sake, you should both just acquiesce and like kind of um, acquiesce to the other in that way. What the Buddha was basically saying in that was there's nothing more important than social cohesion. Even these rules like, because of course, both parties feel like they are defending the Dharma, right? And this idea that he broke the rule and we can't let that slide. And the Buddha is basically saying, no, you guys are all breaking the rules now <laughs> by quarreling. And so this question, I, I, you know, I, I read it so many times and it just always hits me, this question, what could you possibly know? And, and right there is, it's the, this answer to what is the right view. And it's like, well, if you're upset and quarreling and fighting people, that's, you do not hold the right view. You're attached to something. And the right view is about not doing that in that way. So that's the first thing I kind of wanted to point at in terms of like this right view, wrong view. And it's really powerful. It's like super powerful in our own lives to notice when we're upset about something, even, even in a state of what we would call like righteous indignation, where we feel like, no, I'm on the right side here. But we need to look deeper at that in terms of quarreling. Like if you're in a fight with somebody about, I don't know, the environment. And standing on the idea of the righteous, like, no, we need to protect the environment. And the idea here is, is like, is me arguing that with this person going to save the environment? It's probably just not in that way. And that's where, of course, we get into ideas about upaya and skillfulness and skillful means and recognizing that, oh, if I'm engaged in a conversation with somebody, there's a much more expedient way to talk about this. And what we're kind of reading about here is that quarreling and stabbing each other with verbal daggers isn't going to get anywhere. In, in fact, I was um, there was beautiful statements from the, the Nyanamoli book.
There, so just, I'm going to share just a few of these with you. So this is, I'm reading from this. These are quotes from the Buddha, but from the other sources of information about Kosambi, this dispute. And he says something like this, for example. Um, when many voices shout at once, there's none that thinks they're the fool. <laughs> Brilliant. Um Let's see. Oh, there were just these really beautiful parts in here. Where is it? Well, it was basically, I should have marked these. So I'll read you this one. This is sort of a sentiment that it's sort of the one of the last sentiments that the Buddha gave regarding this uh, quarreling. He says, if you can find a trustworthy companion with whom to walk, both virtuous and steadfast, then walk with them content and mindfully, overcoming any threat of danger. If you can find no trustworthy companion with whom to walk, who is both virtuous and steadfast, then, like a king leaving their kingdom, walk like a tusker alone in the woods. Better it is to walk alone. <clears throat> there is no fellowship with fools. Walk alone, harm none, and know no conflict. Be like a tusker walking alone in the woods. So that kind of, again, that kind of, uh, it kind of expresses that root, the deep Buddhist sentiment that it is much better in a way to walk alone than to be in conflict in that way. That, that the, the peaceful life is ultimate in that sense. So, all right. If so, unless there's any questions about all of that, let's get to these seven knowledges. So regarding these um, obsessions of the mind, <clears throat> so you might have noticed that those are the five nivaranya, the five hindrances they're called, but the word nivaranya literally means coverings, and they are coverings of the mind. And they are sensual uh, lust or sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness and worry, and doubt. So those are those these five coverings of the mind that are prohibiting, blocking, the blocking our enlightenment in that sense. And so, a bhikkhu goes to the forest, goes to the root of a tree or an empty hut. And the first thing they do is they check in with themselves and they ask themselves, am I obsessed about anything? Am I, you know, craving sexuality? Am I angry at somebody? Am I kind of sleepy and low energy? Am I anxious? Or am I doubtful that this is even going to do anything? Right? So those are these five hindrances and the person the meditator checks in with themselves but then if one understands no there's no obsession with any of those five things they're all abandoned right then that person thinks my mind is well disposed to awakening to the four noble truths to awakening to the truths and this is the first knowledge attained by one that is noble, transcendent, or also called super mundane, and not shared by ordinary people. So that one is basically about having the hindrances, being with the five hindrances, or not being with the five hindrances. And then if one recognizes, oh yeah, I'm not horny, I'm not angry, I'm not tired in that way. I'm not anxious. And I think this is going to work. <laughs> I have no doubt. <laughs> then the hindrances are kind of gone in that way. And one knows that, oh, I am now well disposed to awakening to the truths. 
I, it's not, I have awakened to them. It's recognizing that I'm in a position now to awaken to them. So that's the first knowledge. Always feel free to jump in. Again, a noble disciple considers this way, considers thus. When I pursue, develop, and cultivate this view, do I personally obtain serenity? Do I personally obtain quenching? And one understands this. When I pursue, develop, and cultivate this view, I personally obtain serenity. I personally obtain quenching of suffering. This is the second knowledge attained by one that is noble, super mundane, and not shared by ordinary people. So let's kind of look at that. So again, I kind of wanted to put it in the best way I could of like, what is the view? Well, let's remember, because I didn't say it earlier. So just in case, just in case there's anybody new out there or just hadn't heard it in a while, when we're talking about a view, right? We are talking about what would be called a worldview or a point of view, uh, an opinion, a belief, but it's about how you see the world. That's a view. And there's a lot of different ways to see the world. But, but, yeah, so many different ways to see the world. But there's this one way that is noble, transcending, all of these things, liberating, and all of those things. And the way that I defined it, this view, would be basically that if you were ready to argue with anybody about it, that's the wrong view. And so the right view then is this non-attached, non-clinging type of position. And what we want to recognize, and this is the second knowledge, we want to recognize that if like basically I was really tapped into that view where I really wasn't attached in that way that to the point where I was ready to fight somebody about it, the realization would be that right here, right now, I personally attain serenity from this view. And I, right here, right now, I attain a quenching of the thirst, of the tanha, of the craving that's producing the suffering. And this is, of course, a, a topic that we talked about a few weeks ago. I forget which sutta that was, but it was about how the Buddha is always talking about what I'm teaching is realizable right here and right now. This is not about your next life. This is not about multiple lives from now. It's actually, it's about you right now. And so one can kind of, from developing this view, this mysterious view that we kind of keep talking about in that way, one can personally obtain serenity and this quenching of craving in that way. Yeah. So that's the second knowledge. Again, a noble disciple considers this way. They think, is there any other recluse or Brahmin outside the Buddha's dispensation possessed of a view such as I possess? And they understand thus. There's no other recluse or Brahmin outside of Buddhism, basically, possessed of a view such as I possess. This is the third knowledge attained by one that is noble, super mundane, and not shared by ordinary people. Now, it's on this note that I kind of want to jump in here and I want to re remind us of a few things. The first thing I want to remind us of is that this is a, one of the old Pali suttas, right? From the old canon in that way. And so it sort of, well, it's not a Mahayana sutra in that way. It doesn't have the exact same underlying teachings in that sense. And so what I'm getting at is, is that in earlier Buddhism, 
you do find, or at least I find in the early, earlier Buddhist canon, you find a little bit more of like Buddhism patting itself on its back in a way. <laughs> and this is what I mean by this sentiment of like, the, the practitioner who has developed this view is sort of basically saying like, yeah, nobody, nobody's got this view. The other people, other religions, they don't have this view. Now, I want to kind of make it clear that like myself, I think this way, meaning I look at other religions, other philosophies, and I think, yeah, they don't share this view. Meaning they they do believe in selves, they believe in phenomena, they but they have all these things. So they all those other teachings are different in that way. So what I'm getting at is, is that there's a way to appreciate what's being said here, but also kind of recognize that there's a little twinge of arrogance to it almost in that way. But on that note, I want to say my the other thing about this sutta. I want us to remember that this sutta is a particular teaching being given to these quarreling monks in Kosambi, not to householders, not to people in the year 2024, but to a group of monks quarreling in this place, Kosambi. And I always, in I'm saying this a lot in Dharma doors, it's always important to be aware of where, you know, where and when and for whom a sutta is being taught. Because these things are extrapolatable. Like you can you can extrapolate in that way. Like, like I did earlier when I used the example of a newlywed couple and the husband leaves the toilet seat up. Like that's a way of extrapolating the story of Kosambi for a kind of a modern couple in that sense or what have you. So you can extrapolate these things, but you also have to be aware of who the Buddha is talking to and why in that sense. And so basically the reason why I say that is because I read this as the Buddha basically saying to the, the monks at Kosambi, you're acting like them. Like you're, you're behaving as if you have their view, not the noble view in that sense. So, so, <clears throat> okay. This next one, uh, section 11, paragraph 11, this one's going to be, uh, it's going to introduce a term that's going to be a little tricky, but the Buddha says, Again, a noble disciple considers thus. Do I possess the dharmata, the, the fundamental dharma, or the do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? What is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a person who possesses right view. Although they may commit some kind of offense for which a means of rehabilitation has been laid down, they still at once confess, reveal, and disclose it to the teacher or to wise companions in the holy life. And having done that, they enter upon restraint for the future. Just as a young tender infant lying prone at once draws back <clears throat> when it puts its hand or its foot on a live hot coal, so too, that is the character of a person who possesses right view. All right. So this introduces actually what of, in Buddhism eventually becomes a very technical term. The term is dharmata. Dhammata, I guess, in Pali. And it's a really... <clears throat> it's a it's a complex term I, I don't know what to tell you it's it's a, of course a form of the word dharma right but it's often sometimes called as the dharmic principle and i'm here 
I don't think it's being used in the ultra technical sense. I think it's being used here. If, if you were to ask me, do I, when it's the, the, the noble disciple is reflecting, do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? The only thing that I would want to kind of mention is that it's probably using this technical term to avoid that kind of upadana ownership of this view. Like it's trying to kind of avoid creating an agent who is the possessor of this view. Buddhism, of course, having this teaching of no self, it sometimes takes these routes to avoid reinforcing the agent, the, the subject in that way. So I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't read too much into the dharmata uh, word here, but I want you to know that that's the word they're using. But so what are they saying though? So in terms of this question of like, so do I have right view? <laughs> like, how do I know if I'm in line in accord with the Buddha Dharma? How do I know if I have the right view? So a noble disciple, they think this, they ask, do I have the character of somebody with the right view? What is the character of somebody with the right view? And what it is, is that if somebody commits an offense, even if there's like a whole procedure that will alleviate them of any karmic responsibility for that, they want to get it done right now. They want to jump to it. They want to go right to their teacher and confess it right away because for somebody with the right view, committing any kind of karmic offense that way, it's like touching a hot coal. And you're like, oh, I you know, mistake in that way. That's the kind of the correct attitude towards transgression by one who has right view there um they talk about this a lot in the bodhisattva path actually this particular quality and what it is is they basically talk about a bodhisattva developing like a kind of deep not worry but a concern about breaking rules and like a real deep desire to not do it in that way and I want you to kind of like notice that there's sort of a difference between like following rules and in a way, even wanting to follow the rules. There's a difference between that and like deeply not wanting to break any rules in that way. So one who has, yeah, no, please. It seems like there's got to be an element there too of under you know trusting the rule and understanding why it's there. It, to it, you're not just upset because you broke it; you're upset because you did harm. Presumably, like the rule is keeping you from doing harm. Excellent. And, and also, like a level of uh, honesty going on there, like because you're not waiting for someone to catch you. <laughs> you're just like, yeah, I did this thing. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and I think we're to understand, Noam, that there's a way that, you know, because there, uh, if you don't know, let me give you the quick backstory about why they're mentioning it this way. So in the Buddhist tradition, like going back to definitely back to these days, what would happen was, is that on the, the new moon and the full moon, so every two weeks on the moons, all the monastics, male and female, they all shave their head. So you normally you would do this on the new moon and the full moon. You'd shave your head, you'd wash your clothes, you'd wash your body, you get all clean. And then all the monastics get together on the night of the new and full moon. And that's the opportunity for anybody who's broken a rule to say, I broke a rule. And then you would either kind of get your, if there's any punishment, you would kind of get it there, but that's your opportunity to confess. But the idea is, is what happens if I broke a rule and it's, you know, a week and a half until Upasata, the, the ceremony? 
this person doesn't want to sit with that kind of guilt in that way for a week and a half until the process of confession. They want to go again, they want to go right to their confessor in that way. So just the the uh, the kind of uh, litigious background of Buddhism in that way, because they have quite, you know, procedures for all of this. So. All right. Next one. One understands thus. I possess the character of a person who possesses right view. <laughs> This is the fourth knowledge attained by one that is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. <laughs> so, one knows that one is like that in that sense. All right. Again, a noble disciple considers this way. Do I possess the character of a person who possesses right view? What is the character of a person who possesses right view? This is the character of a person who possesses right view. Although they may be active in various matters for their companions in the holy life, yet they have a keen regard for training in the higher virtue, training in the higher mind, and training in the higher wisdom. Just as a cow with a new calf, while she grazes, watches her calf, so too, that is the character of a person who possesses right view. So, although they may be active in various matters for their companions in the holy life, yet they are keen, yet they have a keen regard for training in the higher virtue, higher mind, and higher wisdom. So those are those three divisions of the Buddha teachings, right? The moral discipline, sort of the philosophy and the meditation, those three aspects. And as I understand this, what they're saying is that this noble disciple is engaged in the basic life of being a monk with the other monks and kind of upholding that life. But they of themselves have a keen pursuit of deepening their learning deepening their practice, deepening their uh, cultivation of the precepts in that way. So just that idea of like, not just staying where everybody else is at in that way, but wanting to go deeper and deeper and deeper. That's an aspect of one, or that's another aspect of this knowledge. Yeah. Make sense to everybody? Cool. Next up, one understands thus. Ah, I, this is the conclusion of that one. I'm sorry. And then the conclusion of that is one understands this. I possess the character of a person who possesses right view. And that's the fifth knowledge attained by one who is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. Next up for the sixth knowledge. Again, a noble disciple considers thus, do I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view? What is the strength of a person who possesses right view? This is the strength of a person who possesses right view. When the Dharma and the Vinaya, the discipline, so when the Dharma and the discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata are being taught, one heeds it gives it attention, engages it with all their mind, hears the Dharma with eager ears. One understands thus, I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view. This is the sixth knowledge attained by one that is noble, super mundane, and not shared by ordinary people. So this is one, you know, I can definitely vouch for in that way of the excitement for the Dharma in that way, the, the eagerness to hear the Dharma. I uh, certainly remember sort of the transition in my own practice when, you know, Dharma study, Sutra study, all of this study went from 
you know, something that was laborious because I didn't understand it and I didn't understand the language and understand all these words. And at a certain point when I feel like, you know, I had grokked it, as they say, and kind of understood it, there just reached a point where it was like, that was all I wanted to read. That was all that interested me in that way. I, was, I had eager ears for the Dharma and all I wanted to listen to were anything, you know, Dharma related and all of that. So that's sort of my personal experience with this sixth knowledge here of having the strength, I guess, of a person with right view. And it kind of makes sense in that way, in that sense that kind of, you know, once you really tap into that right view, expressions of the wrong view sort of hurt your ears a little bit in that way, where it's a little sort of like, hmm, well, that's unfortunate. Oh, <laughs> well, that'll lead to suffering. Whereas all these teachings that are just all coming out of right view, and there's hundreds and thousands of these teachings that are all coming from right view. And all of a sudden, there's an eagerness to hear more about that in that way. And hear it expressed in different ways and hear it, all of that. So, all right. And the final knowledge. Again, a noble disciple considers thus. Do I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view? What is the strength of a person who possesses right view? This is the strength of a person who possesses right view. When the Dharma and the discipline proclaimed by the Tathagata is being taught, one gains inspiration in the meaning, gains inspiration in the Dharma, gains gladness connected with the Dharma. And one understands thus, I possess the strength of a person who possesses right view. This is the seventh knowledge attained by one who is noble, super mundane, not shared by ordinary people. When a noble disciple is thus possessed of seven factors, they have well sought the character for realization of the fruit of stream entry. When a noble disciple is thus possessed of seven factors, they possess the fruit of stream entry. This is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. All right, so that last one is not so much the eagerness to hear the Dharma, but the delight in hearing the Dharma. So you can kind of think of it as one is, is like, I can't wait to hear me some Dharma. And then the set, the next one is, is like, that was great Dharma. <laughs> like delighted in it in that way. So. All right. And I wanted to, I'm glad we got all the way through the sutta. And I basically want to conclude with a little chat about stream entry, like what that might mean and all of that. But any questions about the sutta? You'll notice the Buddha didn't really get back to the quarreling monks. He basically just drops this big discourse on right view and basically says, you guys are not up upholding right view <laughs> in that way. So, so yeah, Robin, please. Hmm? Okay. Well, thanks. Oh, this is really exciting because um, uh, this is like one of the eight pivotal moments in the Buddha's career that is um, um, memorialized in uh, one of the eight stupas. Um, and so it's just a, um, uh, it's, it's terrific to know more about this in detail. Oh, yeah. By the way, that reminded me, um, I don't have it. I, I, I've been meaning to get it, but um, Wisdom Publication uh, and Bhikkhu Bodhi, Working with Wisdom. So they have a series of books, a bunch of different books, um, and there's one book in particular, which is, it's called the, the Buddha's Teachings of Social Harmony. 
it might there's something more to it but it's basically wisdom publications biku bodhi and it's biku bodhi again has gone through and pulled out the, all the different sutras that are dealing with social cohesion like this one this is one of the main ones and so if you're interested in this topic which i think is a really important buddhist topic that you know there's so much especially in Western American Buddhism, there's so much focus on the individual practice of meditation. And, you know, Buddhism has so much to offer in terms of, um, you know, social structures in that way. So much in terms of like organizational structures and hierarchies and maintaining, like this is all documented. It's really well documented. So Anyways, there's that book that I wanted to mention that, um, again, pulls from other sutras that deal with the same topic. All right, so let's just conclude by this talk about stream entry in that way. So, you know, first of all, I guess what I would want to say is that well, I'll put it to you this way. Uh, there's so many different things I'd actually like to say about this. Um, I suppose the one thing about it, just to, so to clarify again, I think it was last week or, yeah, I think it was last week's Dharma Doors. And last week's Dharma Doors, uh, I think it was Noe, who's not here this evening, um, but he brought up the Buddhist term or the Buddhist idea of going against the stream. And we were talking about Buddhism as being this sort of, um, well, an interesting tradition for going kind of against the grain or against the stream of a lot of uh, conditioned behavior, habitual actions, and just all kinds of things in that way. And in last week's Dharma Doors, when we were talking about that, we were talking about the stream, <laughs> this stream of, and this is where it gets tricky because the stream is an analogy and it's an, an analogy for a lot of things in that way. And it's an analogy for the stream of transmigration, like the cycle of birth, death and rebirth. But if you know your dharma, you know that it is habitual karmic actions that are propelling that flowing stream of transmigration. So the idea here is, is that to practice Buddhism in that way is to step into the stream and to start going against the stream in that way. And so in order to do that, you have to be a stream enterer. You have to enter the stream in that way. So the way that I understand stream entry is that it's about, you know, look around. There's a big culture and a big society, a big world here that if you start looking at it, you realize that it is perpetuating a certain view, if you will. And it's not, you know, the particular a particular view meaning it's not like a particular religious view because there's a lot of different religious views and it's not a particular political view because there's a lot of different political views. But what I'm getting at though, is that there's one kind of dominant view of the world and it's the view of selves being in the world. And again, except for Buddhism, I have yet to find any other tradition that's not talking about selves in that way. Now, what I'm getting at is, is that because most, if not all of these other ideologies are perpetuating that idea of self, they're constantly reinforcing that. And of course, if, again, if you start looking around, you'll notice that society and culture are all about constantly reinforcing that. And so we're all sort of born into a cultural hegemonic stream that is conditioning us to think a certain way, live a certain way, 
buy things a certain way, doing all things a certain way. And if you really dig deep into that stream or that way, it's definitely supporting or, you know, providing you a lot of opportunity for clinging, <laughs> providing you a lot of opportunity for attachment in that way. So what I'm getting at is that to go against that is huge. It's huge. It's what I was talking about last week, that it basically amounts to being superhuman. Because to be human is to be in the cycle of buy, sell, all of these ideas. So my definition of stream entry is, is the moment you're starting to move against that cultural stream in that way. But that's my definition. And, and I want to make it really clear that that's my definition. Within the world of Buddhism, this, especially the Theravada tradition, this whole stream entry thing becomes very um, codified. Like there starts to become like almost um, like where you would get a, a stream enterer badge. Like you did it. Here's your stream enterer badge. And if you keep going, you'll get your once returner badge and then your non returner badge. And then you'll get your Arhat badge. So earlier Buddhism seems to have codified and solidified these to where they were like socially recognized status positions, if you will, and not necessarily like spiritual meditative attainments, if, if you understand what I mean. Like you may not have totally started going against the stream, but you might have been deemed a stream enterer by your teacher in some traditions. And then you're a stream enterer. Again, a lot of different interpretations of what that means. But then there's these stages after that, the non-returner or once returner, non-returner. And what I want you to notice about that really quickly that idea of being a stream enterer, but then cultivating to the point where you're actually only going to be reborn one more time, a once return. Or you're not even going to be reborn at all on earth anymore. And you'll finish out your cultivation in some other realm. That's a non-returner. Or there's an arahat. Now, the thing about it is, is that that system, as it, it as it it says, it's very focused on reincarnation. And yeah, ultimately reading this, reaching the state of an arhat that is no longer bound to reincarnation. But oh, and by the way, I think if you're a stream enterer, you have seven more rebirths at most. That becomes kind of a codified aspect of it. My point is, is this. The Mahayana tradition, the Mahayana Buddhist tradition has issue with the whole stream enterer, non-returner, once returner, non-returner stuff. And it basically, the Mahayana tradition is basically saying, what are they talking about? <laughs> Didn't they get the message? Didn't they get the memo? There is there is no rebirth. Why are we still talking about that? And so there's a very, very famous part of the Vajra Sutra, otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra. And it's it might be chapter nine. I can't remember exactly which chapter it is, but it's a very famous chapter where the Buddha basically redefines stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, arhat. And I'll just give you the, the quick bullet point. What the Buddha says is, is that <laughs> there is no stream and there's nobody to enter it. To understand that, that's stream entry. And 
that's like classic Mahayana Bodhisattva Dharma there. And what I mean is, is that I want you to notice that we haven't, the Buddha in the Vajra Sutra, he doesn't do away with the idea of stream entry. It's not that he says there's no such thing as stream entry. He just defines it in a slightly more sophisticated way that doesn't reinforce kind of these delusional ideas. And so if you've ever had issues with once returner, non returner stuff, it, you're probably a Mahayana type of a Buddhist in that way because they don't like that either. So, just wanted to mention that. So, that's one. Uh, and by the way, that that particular Vajra Sutra definition of stream entry, which is that there is no stream and nobody to enter it, if you understand that, that's stream entry. That's actually not so far from our sutta tonight, actually, in terms of the right view in that way, that it would fit in very well with this sutta in that sense. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about social harmony, loving kindness, stream entry. Forget what other topics we had. Cool, then I'll just leave you with this last note to kind of summarize the whole sutta. You know, this is about quarreling and stabbing each other with verbal daggers. And I would, as a practice, you know, I would really want us to all, I would encourage us all to basically really look at any quarrels we have going on or if they arise any bickering, any disputes in that way, any non-cohesion, and kind of really use this teaching about views or right view and kind of, you know, not in any kind of uh, reactionary way, but if you're quarreling or brawling in that way, you can probably be pretty sure that you're holding the wrong view at that time. <laughs> Right. That's the, the message we could get out of this sutta is that if you're quarreling with somebody, I know that our go to place is. But they started it. I understand they started it, but the idea, though, is that if you're still quarreling, it doesn't matter who started it in that way, because if you're part of the quarreling, then you're not in line with right view in that sense, or at least that's the lesson. And so we can kind of use any quarrel as an opportunity to practice in that way, in terms of noticing, oh, we're quarreling. Why are we quarreling? And then look at your own view at that point. Look at whatever it is that you're holding on and attached to and ask yourself why, like what's, what's up with this in that way? Is it is this more important than my social cohesion with this person? And then how could this be more important than that? Think, you know, food for thought in that sense. So yeah, Maria. I just wanted to offer um, some real life stuff that's been going on that's related to this. So I had two sort of big um, troubling knots or things that are going on that I'm suffering with right now. And one was like around clinging and the other one was around sort of being stuck in my approach to the problem and um, I just sort of started, um, well, I actually added a second sit to my day for, for the past few days. And then just, you know, very recently, like I'd say the past 48 hours, there was like this kind of clarity that came, maybe you could call it right view, sort of came and the problems like the anxiety or the clenching around them just sort of released. It sort of released. And then I was like, oh, 
Like I know what to do. And so the, the suffering sort of released, but it was all around this whole, sort of like holding a position or holding a view. And now I just, yeah, it's, I wanted to share that because it's so closely related to this. Uh, Maria, I mean, thank that's, you. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing. That sounds to me, uh, that sounds to me like a personal obtaining of serenity and a personal obtaining of quenching, to quote the sutta, <laughs> from being in line with right view. <laughs> so there you have it, folks. Proof. Proof. <laughs> yeah, no. Testimonial. Yes, testimonial. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. That's so cool. I, I just wanted to share something else, which is it's the word quarreling is is a little vague, but in the beginning, it's a little more um, when it's describing the quarreling, it's like verbal daggers like that's pretty strong. Right. And I just am thinking about that if you can talk to people about your di differences or disagreements, that can actually be, that can actually improve your connection with them if you're not doing it with verbal daggers or, you know, some of these other words. So, you know, it's still a quarrel. I, I, it's fine. The word quarrel is fine, but it's not, the sutra is not saying don't talk to people about your disagreements. It's kind of how you do it. Right. Indeed. And, and again, from the way the stories you know, relay that I tried to, that's what the Buddha was trying to do, right? He was trying to say, like, talk this out. Don't fight it out in that way. And so totally no. Absolutely. Robin? And it's kind of like when you were saying last week about um, applying principles. Uh, and so these are like principles that we can use versus sort of just saying, um, you know, something helped me or whatever. It was just so beautiful to be given these principles. Excellent, Robin. Indeed. Last week I was talking, of, this is a great example of, of that, where I was, I was using this phrase that the Dharma's contentless. And this is sort of, it doesn't matter what you're arguing about. Like, it's not about the content of the argument. It's about that the fact that there is argument at all. And so that's a principle in that way of understanding that if there's any quarreling going on, then there's error in that way. So awesome. All right, everybody, there we have it. Another sutta. Excellent. Um, thank you all for being here. Great to see you all as usual. Uh, and I will be back next week, uh, and hopefully you'll have eager ears for more Dharma. Yay. Do a new sutta. <laughs>